Okay. With these things in view, let me begin talking about what we're going to do today. Some of you have come and they've heard, you've heard some of my videos, the tapes, and the things we do with Focus on Israel. You've heard some of this material before, but there's people who've never heard it before, so I've got to give a brief introduction. When you read the New Testament as a Jewish book, instead of as a Gentile book, and you have to remember, every writer of the New Testament, except for Luke, was a Jew. And Luke was even a convert to Judaism. When you read it that way, it reads quite differently, quite differently than the Western Gentile Church reads it. Let's begin by looking at the way the New Testament handles the Old Testament. When Jesus is born, King Herod dies, Matthew quotes Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And he says, out of Egypt I've called my son. Now when you turn to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, and say, out of Egypt I've called my son, exegetically, by our Western way of interpreting the Bible, by our Western hermeneutics, if you like theological terms, Matthew is taking Hosea 11.1 1 out of all reasonable context. It's talking about the Exodus. It's talking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. But Matthew says, it's about the Messiah, when Herod dies. One of two things are possible. Either the New Testament is an absurd document because it's twisting scriptures and handling them out of all contexts, or else the church is not interpreting the Bible correctly. Now, there are liberal theologians, liberal, non-evangelical Protestants, and Jewish rabbis who say just that, that the New Testament does not handle the Old Testament in an exegetically responsible manner. Therefore, it shouldn't be believed. There are many instances like that in the New Testament. I just gave you one. In fact, what the New Testament does is it uses Midrash. Midrash. While Jewish rabbis will say the New Testament is taking the Old Testament out of all reasonable context, if you read serious Jewish academic theologians, Jewish rabbis who are scholars, people like Jacob Neusner, Gezer Vermesh from Oxford, who's on the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission, Rabbi Pincus Lapid, Rabbi David Fusnick from Hebrew University, the serious rabbinic scholars don't dismiss it as nonsense. They realize how close the New Testament is to things we read in the Dead Sea Scrolls and also to something called Midrash. Jesus was a rabbi. Paul was a rabbi. And they taught the way that other rabbis did. One element of Midrash is this. The Mashal and the Nimshal. A Mashal is an example of something from nature or everyday life. And the Nimshal is its spiritual meaning. A parable is nothing more than an elongated mashal. Here's the story and here's what it means. The book of Proverbs is the book in Hebrew which we call the book of mashals, Mishle. The first half of a proverb is the mashal and the spiritual explanation in the back of it is the nimshal. As a gold ring to a swine's nose, that's the mashal, so is a dutiful woman without discretion, that's the nimshal. See what I'm saying? Jesus taught the way other rabbis did. The basis of Midrash in the times of Jesus was something known as the Nidot of Rabbi Hillel. The Pharisees, we think of them as the bad guys. But compared to the Sadducees and the other sects in Judaism, they were the good guys. Jesus agreed with the Pharisees on most things. He was much closer to them than he was to the other kinds of Jews. Paul was a Pharisee, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, etc. There were two major schools of the Pharisees the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. The school of Hillel is where St. Paul was educated. Rabbi Hillel was a famous rabbi who devised seven steps, which were later expanded to 32 in generations following him, but seven basic methods in approaching the Bible called Midot. Midot. St. Paul was educated in the school of Rabbi Hillel and his tutor was Rabbi Gamaliel, who was the grandson of Rabbi Hillel. Now, Paul had some very famous classmates in Judaism, probably Ankyos, who did a pogrom, the pogrom of Ankyos, a translation of the Old Testament into Aramaic, and also Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who founded rabbinic Judaism. After the temple was destroyed, they decided to make the synagogue the replacement for the temple, and the rabbis the replacement for the Levites and for the priests, the Kohanim. He had some very famous classmates in a very famous school with a very famous tutor. 
And Paul was educated in the Midot of Rabbi Hillel. And you see Paul continually using the Midot of Rabbi Hillel in his epistles. If a Jew were to read the Gospel of St. John in the first century, he would have called it Besorah Be'alke Yochanan. And a Jewish Christian in the first century would have opened it. And he would have read John chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, and he would have said this. This is a midrash on Breshit, a midrash on the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you have the narrative or the story of the creation. And in John chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you have the narrative or the story of the new creation. He would have said, God walks the earth in the creation in Genesis, in Breshit, and then God walks the earth in the new creation in John. He would have said, God comes to separate the light from dark in the creation in Genesis, and God comes to separate the light from dark in the new creation in John. He would have said, the Spirit moves on the water and brings forth the creation in Genesis. And then the Spirit moves on the water and brings forth the new creation in John. And then he would have said, God created the small light and the great light in the creation in Genesis. But then God created Yochanan Hamadvil, John the Baptist, and Yeshua HaMashiach, the great light, small light and the great light, in the new creation in John. That's what he would have said. Now in rabbinics, the fig tree is a metaphor for the tree of life. It seems to appear in Ezekiel 47. Certainly it reappears in the book of Revelation and it's in the garden at the creation. So rabbinically, in the opening chapters of John, when Rabbi Yeshua ben David, Jesus of Nazareth, that's his real name, Rabbi Yeshua ben David, when he sees Nathaniel, Nathaniel, under the fig tree, he wasn't simply saying to him, I saw you under a literal fig tree over on Main Street. He was saying, I saw you, in rabbinic metaphor, midrashically, he was saying, I saw you from the creation, from the foundation of the world, I foreknew you. You see what I'm saying? The church doesn't know how to read the Bible that way anymore. We've lost sight of our roots. Now in Romans chapter 11, this is what St. Paul says. He says, you don't support the roots, the roots support you. You think of an olive tree. The roots are under the ground, you can't see the roots. But you know the roots are there, because if the roots weren't there, you wouldn't be there either. And if the roots died, you would die. Don't lose sight of the roots even though you can't see them. Be aware the roots support you. But the very thing that Paul warned against, the church has fallen into. One of the results of that is we've lost our sight on how to properly understand and interpret the Word of God. You understand what I'm saying? We've just lost sight of these. Now let me explain this. This is for the benefit of people, for the benefit of the video, and for the benefit of people who have never been to these kinds of seminars before. Some of you know most of this. And many of you know at least some of it. The apostles taught midrashically. Jesus taught midrashically. But as the church got further and further from its Jewish roots, people began Greekizing or Hellenizing Christianity. Even in the beginning, Paul was trying to something called contextualize, contextualize the gospel to the Greek world. In other words, explain it to people with a Greek worldview and a Greek mentality in a Greek way. You have the Greek way of thinking and the Hebrew way of thinking. Paul used both. He said, Jews seek the sign, Greeks seek wisdom. He had no problem explaining the gospel to people in their own framework. When the Wicca tr translators went to a certain place in equatorial Africa to translate the Bible, people didn't know what snow was. So when they got to Isaiah 118, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, they translated, your sins shall be white as coconut. That's contextualization. That's one thing to explain the gospel in the context of somebody else's culture, to make them be able to understand it. But it's something else to try to redefine the gospel, or reframe the gospel in somebody else's philosophy. You know what I'm saying? And that's what began to happen as the church got further and further from its Jewish roots and more and more paganistic influences got into it. As a result, the Hebrew way of allegory and typology became replaced by Greek methods. A pivotal person in this was someone called Philo and the people who imitated him. And they began taking Greek methods of allegory. Now you have to be very careful. There's people involved in restorationism and kingdom now today who are doing the same thing. The core of this comes from Gnosticism. Pay attention, this is important. 
What the New Testament does is it uses typology, allegory, symbolism to illustrate and illuminate doctrine. It never bases a doctrine on it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb had to be without spot or blemish. To God, one man without sin is worth more than all the men with sin. That's how one should die for all. When you have a Christ in the Passover demonstration and you understand the symbolism of the Passover meal at the Last Supper, you will understand the Lord's Supper as the way you never would before. You use the typology, the allegory, to illustrate and illuminate doctrine. What I just told you about Nathaniel under the fig tree. There's a verse elsewhere that says, those whom he foreknew, those whom he predestined. You understand? I didn't base the, the fact that Jesus pre-knew Nathaniel on a type or an allegory. I simply said the symbolism, rabbinically, illustrates it. You see what I'm saying? You will understand the Word of God much deeper through the types and allegories, because that's how the New Testament handles Scripture. It's very dangerous, however, and totally unscriptural for people to base doctrines on some subjective mystical insight into the types of allegories. Never base a doctrine on it. The Bible never does. These people with the Joel's Army doctrines and the Manifest Sons of God doctrine, they're doing that today. It's very dangerous and very unscriptural. That's not what I'm at all suggesting should be done. I'm simply saying we need to handle these things the way Scripture does. Now, in Alexandria, things really begin to go wrong. That was the place where the East met the West. Buddhist monks even came to Alexandria and brought Eastern ideas. Zoroastrians came to Alexandria. And these Eastern ideas became more and more apparent in the thinking of the church and all kinds of issues. Not the least of which was the way they interpreted the Bible. Augustine adopted these ideas and took them to the west of the Roman Empire. Such ideas as uh, God knocked Paul off the horse and he used violence to convert Paul so the church can use violence to convert people. But all kinds of things. The, the Good Samaritan. Well, going from Jerusalem to Jericho was the plight of fallen man. Well, you could say that. And you could say that the Levites and the Cohen, the Levites and, and the priests, couldn't really help this man who was fallen. That makes sense. That's biblical so far. There are plain verses that begin to explain that. But then he goes on to say the innkeeper is St. Paul, <laughs> and he gives definitions to the two coins, and all kinds of crazy things. You see what I'm saying? These things came from the Greek world, and they begin defining doctrine on it. Now this gets worse and worse and worse, these platonic ideas and other ideas, up until the Middle Ages. Now, with the Renaissance, the Crusades go to the East and they come back to Europe. And as they come back to Europe, they bring Eastern influences with them from the Islamic world. Remember, when Western civilization declined under medieval Roman Catholicism, the Byzantine Empire, the East of what had been the Roman Empire, and the Islamic world were having a golden age in science, history, literature, medicine, architecture, everything. The Crusades brought these things back, and that planted the seeds for the Renaissance. But someone came along named Thomas Aquinas, and you had a tremendous mushrooming of Aristotelianism, the ideas of Aristotle, replacing the ideas of Plato. Now, Augustine Platonized Christianity. He took it and he made it something platonic, with the Greek ideas of Plato. But Thomas Aquinas comes along, and he makes it something Aristotelian. And for over a thousand years, Roman Catholic history of the Aristotelians fighting the Platonists is crazy. The whole idea of transubstantiation comes from an Aristotelian concept that nobody believes anymore. It's, found, it's unfounded. The idea of the accident and, and, and the host being transubstantiated, it's absolutely absurd, but that's where it comes from. Things that nobody believes anymore, but they hold on to it. Be this as it may, you have this whole Aristotelian thing and then what was already bad in the way they interpreted the Bible became even worse. When the Pope was deposed from Rome to Avignon, France for 70 years, they said that was a Babylonian captivity. <laughs> Crazy things. And it gets worse and worse. Judaism takes the same path under Rambam, Moses Maimonides. What Aristotle did with Christendom, Rambam, Maimonides, did the same thing for Judaism. He Aristotelianized Judaism. He wrote something called The Guide for the Perplexed, which was the Jewish equivalent 
of Summa Theologia, Thomas Aquinas. Things get really bad, and from Aquinas' influence comes this kind of crazy allegorization called medieval scholasticism. Things are terrible. But then, after the Renaissance, you have this rediscovery of Greek and Roman learning, and people begin studying the classics, Latin and Greek literature. They begin studying it in the plain meaning in the original languages, reading it as literature and history. And then people begin reading the Bible as literature and history. These people were called humanists. In this country, Thomas More was a humanist. John Collett was a humanist. In France, it was Lefebvre was a humanist. But the main one was Erasmus. Forget about Luther, Calvin, Zwingli. All these people are the result of Erasmus. He was the real brains on back of what happened in the Reformation. The others were dynamic personalities, but he was a dynamic thinker. It was his ideas. He laid the egg, the others just hatched it. What he did was, he began studying the Bible as literature and history, and rediscovered what the Roman Catholic Church did, how it had gotten away from the simplicity of faith in Jesus. You see what I'm saying? He began to study the Bible as literature and history. Now, when he did that, it opened the door for people to rediscover justification by faith, the gospel, that, that we're not saved by doing penance, going to confession, which was not made a doctrine until the 13th century. The word metanoia, when they begin studying original Greek, doesn't mean to do penance, it meant to repent. They began reading Romans and so on, as Luther did, and they rediscovered the gospel. The problem was, they used humanist scholarship to react against scholasticism. So we don't want any kind of allegory. We don't want any kind of symbolism or typology if it can all be avoided, only when we're forced to do it. So what they do is, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. You understand? We don't want to know this stuff because of what people did with it. And there are people doing it today in, in the Restoration thing, in the Kingdom Now thing. We don't want any typology or allegory. So they just study the Bible as history and literature. Now, if you read Calvin, John Calvin's secular work, his commentary on Seneca's De Clementia, the, the Roman writer, Latin writer, Calvin interpreted the Bible with the same rules of literary criticism that he interpreted secular literature with. And that gave us the way we interpret the Bible. So the church interprets the Bible based on the rules of 16th century humanism, studying it as literature and history. Now this was good as far as it went. It helped people to see how ridiculous Roman Catholicism was, how unscriptural, and, and rediscover the gospel. Actually, there were people who never lost it. In this country, you had Wycliffe and, the, and his followers, and in Europe, you had Jonas Huss and his followers. The Protestants pretended they rediscovered the gospel, but in fact, there were people who were doctrinally much more sound than they were who never lost it. But that's another story. So, they saw all, all typology and allegory goes out. Our rules come from the Reformers, the way we interpret the Bible. Now, the liberal Protestants come, and they say, we also study the Bible as literature and history. Only the Reformers, they believed it was inspired. We just think it's literature and history. You understand? Liberal Protestantism, non-believing Protestantism, David Jenkins type thing. All that is, is the degeneration of original Protestantism. But they both interpret the Bible the same way, critically, in the sense of studying it as history and literature. Now, it's not wrong to do that. It's not wrong at all. The problem is, that's as far as they go. They make rules which people will teach you. One of their rules is this. When the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, don't seek any further sense. You ever heard that? Well, okay. Jesus saw Nathaniel under the fig tree. Big deal. That's all you need to know. No, that's not all you need to know. Jesus was saying something much deeper and much more important and much more profound and he saw him under a literal fig tree. This is a Protestant rule, but it's not a biblical rule. You see what I'm saying? There are many applications of the scripture, but only one interpretation. Now the rabbi said there are multiple interpretations of scripture. Jesus agreed with the rabbis, not with the reformers. Jesus told the Jews, there'll be no sign given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. Now in one of the Gospels, it says the sign of Jonah 
is, as Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be. But in another place, he says, Nineveh repented. The Gentiles repented, but the Jews wouldn't. He gives two entirely different meanings, but two totally valid meanings to the sign of Jonah. You see what I'm saying? Jesus was a rabbi who had a rabbinic perspective. He had a Jewish perspective of a Jewish book, and he taught it that way. Western Protestantism has its own perspective, and they treat it as if it's sacrosanct, that this is the way to handle Scripture. Jesus never did that. Now, it's not wrong to do that. It's not wrong to study as literature and history and to do our exegesis verse by verse. We're studying the book of Romans chapter by... It's not wrong, as long as that's only the first step. But you think about it. Jesus never, Jesus never taught exegetically as such. He taught topically. He'd say, for what is written, and he'd quote from Isaiah. Then he'd say, for what is also written, and quote from Psalms. He argued topically. That's how the rabbis taught. Who tried to pick apart one verse with a pair of tweezers and a magnifying glass? The devil, didn't he? This is what it says, verse by verse exegesis. You see what I'm saying? The church, in its hermeneutics, is following the methods of the devil more than the methods of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to pick a verse apart piece by piece. It's not. But that's where they draw the line. That's the problem. If you pick that verse apart, then you should go to another verse speaking of the same subject, even if it's not in the same book. You see what happens when people try to base doctrines on one book or one passage. That becomes their, their text, and everything rests on that one text. Luther did that with Romans. You find hyper-charismatics will take one verse in Acts and construct a whole theology on it without looking at other things that the Bible says about the subject. You'll find the Calvinists will take one verse in Romans 8 and construct a whole theology on it. Jesus didn't teach that way. He never taught that way. And we should neither. Now, with all due respect to the Reformers, I can understand why they did what they did. They were trying to correct something. They were reacting to a wrong situation. Okay? Maybe for their time, they did the right thing. They may have been faithful to the light they had. I don't say otherwise. But for us, that's not good enough. John Robinson, who was a chaplain to the Pilgrim Fathers, said there is a deeper light in this book that we don't see. He believed that if Calvin and Luther and these people came back, they would complain and say, look, we showed you the way back. We showed you the gospel. We showed you the authority of scripture instead of tradition. But why didn't you continue on the road we sent you on? We put you on the right road, but you didn't go further. You see what I'm saying? I'm not necessarily condemning the reformers. They were trying to correct the wrong situation as best they could in a difficult time in history. The problem is what we've done with it. You see what I'm saying? Plainly, the, the apocalyptic literature of the Bible demands something more. The epistles are commentary on other scriptures. You can read the epistles as letters, verse by verse. But look how the epistles handle other scripture. Look at Galatians chapter 4, 24 to 34. The two women, Sarah and Hagar. That's how it interprets Genesis. That's Midrash. Look at the epistle of Jude, about backsliders and false believers in the church. It's all Midrash. All of it. Scripture doesn't handle scripture the way the church does the way these Gentile church them. You have different literary genre in the Bible. The epistles are one kind, they're letters. But you've got gospels, narratives, historical books, wisdom literature, and what we're going to look at today, apocalyptic literature. Things like Revelation, Daniel, etc. Daniel was told, and as much as told also was John, seal these things up until the time of the end. These things are sealed up. The Holy Spirit has to decipher what these mysteries of the end and the Antichrist mean for the faithful. They have to be deciphered for the people of God in the end. Be careful of people who write a commentary or a book on Revelation and Daniel and say they've got it all figured out. Be careful. Read the book, but remember, the Bible itself, the Holy Spirit tells us these things are going to be manifested to the faithful when the time comes, to the faithful. You are never going to understand these things about the end times and the last days using these Western Gentile Protestant methods. You will never understand it. Never. And today, Lord willing, I'm going to give you an overview of what I mean. 
Before we begin looking at more complex genre, let's look at a genre more simple, an epistle. Open with me, please, to 1 John, the first epistle of St. John. Chapter 2. Verse 15, I'll begin in verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. All this goes back to the garden. It goes back to the garden, the way that Satan got to Adam and Eve. Then it goes back to the temptation narrative. The same things that Satan tried on Adam, he tried on Jesus, but failed. The first Adam failed. The second Adam didn't. Satan failed. These were the things, the world, the cosmos, the lust of the eyes. And the world is passing away in its lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know the truth, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son? Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Now, first of all, as we'll see later this afternoon, it's alluding to Judas, who went out from among us. Remember, both Judas and the Antichrist, the Antichrist, with the definite article, are the sons of tradition. They're the only two people ever demon-possessed by Satan personally. A lot of people are demon-possessed, but demon-possessed by him personally. Many, many parallelisms between Judas and the Antichrist. And this false brother going out among us is another. We'll look at this later, Lord willing. But it's saying three things. The Antichrist. Antichrist, there's many of them and what we might call the spirit of Antichrist. It's already in the world. Always been there. Something which denies the father and the son relationship is by definition Antichrist. Now to begin with, you've got to understand the Greek word anti does not simply mean against. It means against in the sense of being in place of. You know what I'm saying? If you were to translate it to Latin, it would be vicarious. If you were to translate it to English, it would be vicar. <laughs> there is someone who is in fact the true vicar of Christ. The Gospel of St. John tells us the Holy Spirit. He's the one who acts in place of Christ and for Christ and Christ in him and through him. But there's someone else who wears a white yarmulke, and he's not even Jewish, who claims to be the vicar of Christ. Okay? If you were to take the term, the vicar of Christ, which is the Pope's title, and translate it into Greek, it would be anti Christus. Exactly. Okay? That's only the beginning. In the early church, of course, you had two kinds of religion. Religio licita and religio illicita, legal religions and illegal religions. As long as you acknowledge the emperor, you can have any religion you want. And the Romans would take your God and put it in the Roman pantheon and make it part of the Roman religious system, with the head of it being the emperor. Now, the emperor's title was Pontificus Maximus or for short, the pontiff. 
He was the head of the pantheon. There were two kinds of people who had a problem with emperor worship. Jews and Christians. Emperor worship is a major thing that teaches about the Antichrist. Jews made a deal. We'll sacrifice for the emperor. We can't sacrifice to him. Initially, Christians were protected because they were seen as a messianic sect within Judaism. They were simply Jews who believed he was the Messiah. They were protected. But when the rabbis ostracized Jewish believers and booted them out of the synagogues, they were no longer protected. They became religio illicita and they were persecuted because they wouldn't bow the knees to the pontiff. Now, who's the pontiff today? The Pope. After Constantine's ostensible conversion to Christianity, thought as a way to hold together his collapsing empire, he made Christians the religion of the state. And he passed on much of the imperial power, but also the pontifical power, to the Pope. And as paganism came into the church, he began to say this, you have a pagan god of gift giving? St. Nicholas. A pagan god of love? That's St. Valentine. And New Pontiff. Believe whatever you want as long as you acknowledge the Pontiff, is what Imperial Rome said. Now, in La Paz, Bolivia, 1987, and about three and a half months ago in Santo Domingo in the Caribbean, something interesting happened. This present Pope met in Assisi, Italy and similar such meetings in Canterbury Cathedral, the Dalai Lama, he was called the great spiritual ruler, okay, with uh, Buddhist monks, Tibetan monks, Zoroastrian priests, African witch doctors, only asking that he be seen as the spiritual guide of the world. Okay to be anything, as long as you acknowledge him. All these religions are okay with him ecumenical and interfaith. But in La Paz, Bolivia, and in Santo Domingo, there was one faith he condemned. Which faith did the pontiff condemn? The same faith the pontiff condemned 2,000 years ago. Yours. You understand? The tremendous evangelical revival throughout South America, Latin America, the Philippines, he's warning against these things. You understand? It's the spirit of Antichrist. But let's continue. The spirit of Antichrist that which denies the father and the son relationship. When a religion denies that, it is antichrist. You know what liberal Protestantism is? Jesus was just a uniquely inspired man. The theological term was actually adoptionism in the ancient church. It was always around, people believe that. He was just a great rabbi or a great moral teacher. Sort of like what liberal Protestant clergy believe. He was just an example and a moral teacher. That is the spirit of Antichrist. It denies the father and son relationship. You understand? Islam. We'll talk about it later when we talk about the abomination of desolations, but on the Dome of the Rock, on the Temple Mount, is a quotation from a Surat in the Koran, God has no son. Right on the Temple Mount, abomination of desolations. We'll talk about that. Okay? Islam is an Antichrist religion. Rabbinic Judaism. I was absolutely shocked some months ago. He wasn't there at the time, but I visited the office of this guy called Jay and Merrily Rawlings in, in Jerusalem. They wrote a book called Hunters and Fishers or something. I personally thought the book was not balanced, but anyway, I went to their office to help someone do something. They had posters all over about Rabbinic Judaism, Jerusalem, the center of, of Judaism, and a poster of Rambam. Maimonides, the same rabbi who Aristotelianized Judaism. He's the person who changed the meaning of the Shema. You know what the Shema is? Here is Israel, the Lord our God is one. He changed the meaning of the Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Achad. He changed the meaning of Yahid and Achad from the number one, from plurality, Achad like Achdud, brotherhood, compound one, to the number one. He changed the meaning of Achad and Yahid in Hebrew to point away from Jesus being divine. Because the, the Shema says, Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, Elohim is plural, in Hebrew, is unity. That's what it is. He is one Lord. Sort of the same term that you have for sexual relations in Genesis, becoming one flesh, that kind of unity. He's got posters of these guys. Not one place is there a poster about Jesus. 
Nothing, because he doesn't want to offend the rabbi. Now this is an anti-Christ religion. Look what Jesus says about rabbinic Judaism in the book of Revelation. He's speaking to the early church. And in verse 9 of Revelation 2, the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Rabbinic Judaism, not to be confused with Mosaic Judaism, not the Judaism of the Old Testament, of the Tanakh, but what the rabbis had invented to replace it after the temple was destroyed, is a false religion. It's demonic. It's a synagogue of Satan. When I see born-again Christians going to these feasts in Jerusalem of various kinds, Judaism and isn't it wonderful in the world, they don't know what they're doing. When they're putting rabbis up to some kind of holy man, these rabbis don't even practice Kabbalah. They practice witchcraft. Jesus calls it a synagogue of Satan. Be careful of philo-Semiticism. It is just as bad as anti-Semitism. Love the Jews, yes, but don't love Judaism. If you love Jews, you can't love rabbinic Judaism. It's a false religion that will lead those people to hell. There's only one true Judaism, Messianic Judaism. The Judaism fulfilled in Jesus. There's the Judaism of Moses that prepared the way for Jesus. And there's the Judaism of Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. This thing you have today is no more, no more the Judaism of, of the Old Testament than Roman Catholicism or David Jenkins is the Christianity of the New. So you've got the spirit of Antichrist. You've got many Antichrists, and there always have been. And we're going to look at types of the Antichrist today. Many types of the Antichrist. These political demagogues who demand to be worshipped, Chauchesco of Romania, Mao Zedong, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Idi Amin, these autocrats, that's the spirit of Antichrist. Saddam Hussein, they demand to be deified. It's, that's, that's the spirit. Roman Catholicism is the spirit of Antichrist. All these things. The spirit of Antichrist. Many Antichrists. But then ultimately there is the Antichrist. We have to understand the spirit of Antichrist and the many Antichrists to understand the one. Some of these guys take the cake. The Antichrist is going to walk off with the whole bakery. It's going to be unbelievable. But not only that, they went out from among us. This is the big problem. The Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, Luke 21. False Christs and false prophets will come among you. Most born-again Christians make this mistake. False prophets... That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the Mormons. That's the R.A. Krishnas. That's the Christian scientists. False prophets, false Christ, that's Reverend Moon. Now, I don't question for one second that the proliferation of these evil cults and these false messiahs are themselves a sign of the end of the world. I don't question that for one second. But those are not the false messiahs Jesus is warning us against. He's warning us against the ones that would get into the church. If possible, even the elect will be deceived. You understand? Satan already has the world deceived. He already has the unsaved deceived. If somebody came along and said he could make Liverpool the greatest port in the world again, he could reopen the coal yards and the, ship, and the, and the shipbuilding yards of, 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 of the Clyde and of, and of Newcastle and give everybody their jobs back, if he could bring economic stability to, to the world, and really bring a new world order where there would be peace and so on, what unsaved person wouldn't follow him? If they could believe he could be credible, particularly if he could counterfeit miracles and things like that. He's already got them deceived. They're deceived already. People in Roman Catholicism, in the cult, in, in nominal Christianity, in Islam, they're already, the anti they're already following the Antichrist. You understand? Who is he trying to get to? Two kinds of people. The Jews and the church. Who are the two kinds of people who had the problems with religio illicita and religio illicita? The Jews and the Bible-believing church. There are two kinds of people the New Testament calls God's chosen. Jews and born-again believers. Who are the two kinds of people 
most persecuted by the old communists. Jews and born-again Christians. Who were the two kinds of people most persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church for centuries with their inquisitions and crusades? Jews and born-again Christians. Who are the kinds of people, come with me to Speaker's Corner in London when I do evangelism there sometimes. Who do the Muslims hate the most? Jews and born-again Christians. You understand? So it goes to Genesis 3. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. God's woman. That's who he's out to get. Because those are the two vehicles that God has ordained to establish his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, unfortunately, Israel is in spiritual darkness. But the Bible promises in the last days, not only will the Jews begin returning to their land, but they begin returning to their Messiah. And it says that their rejection be the reconciliation of the Gentiles. What will their life be for the church except life from the dead? You see that? To a Jew who becomes a Christian, a believer in Yeshua, they say, how could I have been so blind? How could I have not have seen the truth that he's the Messiah? The, the Tanakh, the prophecies, speak so clearly of him. Even the Talmud, you can argue from the Talmud he was the Messiah. But then if something happens to a Jewish Christian a little while later, he begins meeting nominal Gentile Christians. When my wife was saved, she witnessed to an Israeli guy in Jerusalem at Hebrew University. His name was Sassoon. She showed him from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, Jesus was the Messiah, and he became a believer. Then she met some Greek Orthodox Arab girls, and she showed them Jesus was the Messiah. Oh, we know that, that he died for our sins. Oh, yes, we know that, but he rose from the dead. Oh, yes, we know that. It's amazing how the Jews cannot see Yeshua as their Messiah, but you don't think it more amazing to a Jew who becomes a believer if you ask one. How can people believe he's the Messiah? How can they believe the New Testament and not be born again, not be born from above? That Satan was able to pull the wool over the eyes of Israel is his second biggest success since the fall of man. What's his first biggest success? <laughs> pull the wool over the eyes of the so-called church. See what I'm saying? That's who he's out to deceive. Now let's continue with these things. Look at the Gospel of uh, St. John, chapter 7. <clears throat> Some of the multitude, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, This is the Messiah. Others were saying, surely the Messiah is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said he come from the offspring of David and from Bethlehem and the village where he was? Notice what happened. The Jews were expecting the Messiah to come, but only a small remnant were ready. The church should be expecting the Messiah to come, but once again, only a small remnant is ready. And there's all kinds of speculation. What's going to happen? Where is it going to happen? Well, the answers to those questions are in the Bible. But when people don't know their Bible, all kinds of theories begin floating around and all kinds of silly arguments begin taking place. That's what happened among the Jews when he came the first time, and the same thing happens when he comes again. You understand? It requires wisdom to understand the Word of God, to be ready for the Messiah to come. That's what you needed when he came the first time, and that's what we need for him to come again. In the end, wisdom and faithfulness become very closely associated. Wisdom and faithfulness become closely associated, and faithfulness and evangelism become closely associated. Let's look at Daniel chapter 11, verses 33 to 35. All this deception of the Antichrist will be happening replaying the events that surrounded Antiochus Epiphanes. In the story of Hanukkah, we have tapes on the subject. But in verse 33, this is what it says, similar to the way the Maccabees were in those days, and those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help and many will join with them in hypocrisy. 
And some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine and purge and make them pure until the end time because it's still to come. Only the people who had wisdom in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes knew what to do. The Maccabees and those who listened to them instead of going the popular way which was the way of compromise. Daniel describes these things and you have a shift in time frame. Things, some of these things were about Antiochus but then it shifts and there's things Antiochus never did historically. It's only talking about the Antichrist. When you get into the last chapter, chapter 12, verse 10, this is what it says. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. And Daniel describes those who have wisdom. Not only will they understand, but when he talks about the resurrection, he says they will turn many to righteousness. You see, the people in the last days who are going to be ready for Jesus to come back, they're going to have wisdom to understand what's happening through the scriptures. But not only that, their understanding and their wisdom will propel them to a radical sense of evangelism. Now you've got to understand what Daniel's getting at. Look at Daniel, chapter 8. Verses 23 to 25. What happened in the book of Maccabees, Jesus celebrated Hanukkah in John chapter 10, the Hanukkah story. We have a tape on it. Those things teach a lot about the Antichrist and how to overcome him. But in John 8, 23 to 25, in the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue, and his power will be mighty but not by his own power. In other words, he's going to be Satanized. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will and he will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to, success, to succeed. He will cause deceit to succeed by his influence and he will magnify himself in his heart and he will destroy many when they are at ease. Many when they are at ease. Over and over, when the Bible, the Old Testament and the New, warns of the last days, it warns about those who are at ease. Look at Amos, chapter 6, verse 1. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Zephaniah, Zechariah, all of them, those who are at ease. A lukewarm church. Laodicea is the seventh church. Lukewarm Christians are the ones who are not going to have the wisdom. They're the ones who are going to be deceived the most. If your heart is right, you're going to seek wisdom. And if you really are seeking the wisdom, God will give it to you. But that will be manifested the way Daniel said. They will turn many to righteousness. There are very few things that are publicly visible in the spiritual life of a Christian as the attitude to evangelism. How much someone prays other people don't necessarily know. How much time they spend in the Bible, what their personal life is like, their walk with Jesus. You can't always tell those things. But evangelism is something. I don't suggest for one second that because somebody's evangelistic, that means they're right in their relationship with the Lord. Jesus said the Pharisees make a convert and make him twice as much a son of hell as they are. It doesn't make you right if you evangelize. But Christians who lack a fundamental drive to reach the lost, it proves there's something wrong. You see what I'm saying? Those who have wisdom, that wisdom will propel them to see people get saved. There's a difference between the gospel and the gospel of the kingdom. Not like Wimber and these people with their kingdom now theology, that's nonsense. I'm talking about the gospel of the kingdom as an eschatological or last day's gospel. We see it most clearly in Matthew. Jesus talks about hell three times as much as he talks about heaven in Matthew. The Gospel of John, repent for the kingdom is at hand. This sense of urgency, judgment is coming. Peter describes it as the way Noah was, warning people, for God's sake, get on the ark where you still have time. You understand, that's the Gospel of the kingdom. 
A lukewarm church is the kind of church that's rife for deception. And it's happening. How does the church get lukewarm? You've got to understand the days of Noah. Jesus warned this. He said, so it was in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Now there's two messages about the days of Noah. One for the unsaved and one for the saved. Peter warns for the unsaved. They wouldn't listen until the flood came and it was too late to get on the ark. You read the story of Noah. I studied science at university as a kid. There's things happening now in biogenetic engineering that would have seemed like science fiction when I was in university and I'm not even 40 yet. Not that long ago. Take one molecule of DNA from, from Joseph Stalin's bone and then clone it or to genetically engineer a monster and, and, and have a demon possessed, unthinkable, a Spielberg movie? No. Read the days of Noah and Genesis. Read what happened. These demonoids, these monsters, took some kind of human form and procreated with human women, creating monsters on the earth. That really happened. Jesus said, so it will be in the days of Noah. We're heading in that direction. Now, I'm not against genetic engineering, but like anything else man does, the problem is not with man's science or man's intellect. The problem is with man's fallen nature. We're just fallen. Our intellect is fallen. All of us is fallen. We're totally fallen. Anything that can be used for evil will be used for evil. Not that the things are wrong in themselves, but that's the way it is. You see what I'm saying? But that's the message for the unsafe people. What about the message for Christians? What does Jesus say? They will be given in marriage, eating and drinking, and being given in marriage. There's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and getting married. Those things are normal. God created them. The problems are they become an obsession, a fixation. People have their concerns centered on temporal things. As I always point out, the things that are for here are not the things that we are here for. Christians get obsessed with their careers, their businesses, their financial states, their marriages, their relationships, even their ministries. See what I'm saying? That's the danger to Christians. A lukewarm church. Not only that, but Laodicea has to do with people's opinions. Be careful of people who mix their own opinions. They be derivative of the word. Be careful of people who try to take their own opinions and, and, and try to give a doctrinal authority. You see this in the American South and in Northern Ireland where the people politicize the gospel and try to identify the gospel with their political views. Be careful of that stuff. That's Laodicea by definition. Nonetheless, let's continue. Revelation chapter 13, verses 6 to 9. In Hebrew, we call Revelation Chazon Yochanan, the vision of John. And we're looking at Revelation 13, 6 to 9. Now remember, John's epistle begins talking about the Antichrist by saying what? Love not the world. That's how he begins. He prefaces, before he talks about the Antichrist, he prefaces the whole thing by saying, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Christians are to be in the world, but not of it. Cloisterism is totally unscriptural. On the other hand, so is worldliness. John 13, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Now, every Christian is going to be a heaven dweller or an earth dweller. Seven places, the New Testament says the tabernacle is the church of God. Seven places. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Which ones? The ones in heaven? No. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone's name who has not been written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world of the land had been slain. If anyone has ears, let him hear. Daniel says this. He will think to change the laws, the times, and the seasons, and these will be given into his hands. 
One of the things that defines the Great Tribulation is this. God is the God of history. He exercises lordship over history. Even the terrible things that happen, they're in the permissive will of God. He allows them. But a brief time comes at the end of the world, Satan's opportunity. Jesus has three and a half years, I want three and a half years. Where the lordship of history is given over to the God of this world. Parenthetically, within certain parameters, and for a fixed season. But the lordship of history is given into the hands of the God of this world. You understand? The Holy Spirit will no longer restrain wickedness as he does now. God's spirit will not forever strive with man. One of the things about the tribulation. And he will make war with the saints of the Most High even before that persecution, of course, begins. Now, I believe that the church will be rescued out of the tribulation and not go through the worst part of it. Nonetheless, they're certainly going to face persecution and trial. To get these God wants you rich types to say we're not going to suffer. Nonetheless, to overcome them. He wants to overcome them. How does Revelation 13 say he gets people? By taking the mark because they can't buy and sell without it. You understand? We're going into a hyper-consumption oriented society, a consumer society. It's getting more and more like that all the time. Only those who don't love their life in this world will be able to refuse to acknowledge this person. You see, the people who will receive the mark of the beast, whatever that is, have received it already. Now, it obviously connects with the opening chapters of Ezekiel when it says, Feel the those of the Lord. Those who will receive the mark of the beast, literally, in some literal sense, have already received it here and here. The thing is, Jesus was trying to warn Christians not to be among them. Satan always tries to get into the church. Jesus tries to bring the gospel into the world. Satan tries to bring the world into the gospel. I'll give you two examples of how he's doing it at this time in history. Two. We live in a time of Christian feminism. Roger Foster's wife wrote a book on the femininity of God. Now, Orthodox Jews pray, thank God I was not born a dog, a Gentile, or a woman. <laughs> when Paul came along, he began saying a woman is co-heir with Christ and submits to each other in love. He was going against the most radical conventions of the Jews. Nonetheless, the Jews had a much higher view of women than the non-Jewish world. <laughs> okay? But there's still a difference between men and women. Because women are more sensitive, it's easier for them to get saved. But because women are more sensitive, it's also easier for them to be deceived. Have your head covered. Not literally like the old-time brethren, but the principle. Okay? Now, in the last 20 years, although in the beginning, anything begins good. The labor union movements began good. Everything begins good, right? You know, <laughs> the church began good. Everything begins good. Even communism began good. Almost. Everything begins good. Look how it ends up. They may be a feminist movement corrected a lot of injustices, unequal pay for the same jobs, of course. But look what happens. Man has fallen. Doesn't matter how good something begins, look how it ends. Because man has fallen. Only if it's based on God's principles will it amount to anything in the long term. No matter how idealistic its origins are. It will degenerate in entropy. Things have an entropy in physics, you have an entropy in social conditions because of the fall of man. Nonetheless, you look what's happened. Violent crime is increasing among women. Twice as fast as it's increasing among men. Every major sector of the population is, is smoking less or quitting smoking except one, young women. Work-related stress and health disorders related to stress. Peptic ulcers, coronary heart disease, stress-related gynecological disorders, all of these things are growing astronomically among young women. Because, it's, it's, you know what I'm saying? So when you see this thing for women pastors and all this stuff, this is the mentality of the world getting into the church. I'll give you another one. We live in a consumer society. 
A consumer society. Consume, consume, consume. Buy my product. Advertising. Continual bombardment. Professional psychologists advising the advertising industry how to manipulate people to buy things, even buy credit. That's what we live in. The way it works. We all know that. So, you've got the prosperity preacher, the name and claim of people. The consumption mentality of the secular world getting into the church. God wants you rich. You can have this. You can have... You see what I'm saying? They rewrite the gospel and all they're doing is instead of bringing the gospel of Jesus into the world, they're bringing the world into the gospel of Jesus and preaching another gospel. You understand? That's what's happening. And that's what he's warning against. I'm not saying God can't and doesn't bless his people, but be careful these prosperity guys. Not only that, but look at the way they do it. It's all the height of these big guys with the fancy rings and the, and the limousines. They may have the gifts, but Jesus says you'll never know them by their gifts. You know them by their fruits, by their faithfulness. Jesus did miracles. These signs and wonders shall follow them. They'll preach the gospel and the signs and wonders shall follow them. These guys put the signs and wonders above people getting saved. Come and, they, you know, come see this guy. You've got to see the miracles of this guy. This is like a medicine show. You know what I'm saying? He comes around and he's the star and he, you know, Hallelujah, bless God. Hallelujah. Yeah, friends. There's a man here. There's a man here. He's got one leg shorter than another. Hallelujah. God's going to heal him right now. He goes on for this. 20 minutes, and then what do you get? Yes, friends, I want each and every one of you to open up your heart and open up your wallet and show me how much you love the Lord Jesus. Amen. Can you say amen? <laughs> that is setting people up. Look at Zechariah chapter 11. These pathetic buffoons have made born again a household joke in the United States. They're trying to come to your country and do the same thing. Remember, Judas is a type of the Antichrist. The major type of the Antichrist in the Bible is Judas, the major one. Anytime you see something about Judas Iscariot in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something about the Antichrist. Now, verse 13 is about Judas, isn't it? Throw it to the pot of that. I give it some price. Okay? 30 pieces of silver. Look at verse 4. Thus says the Lord, Pass of the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them, slay them, and go unpunished. And each of those who sells them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I have become rich. And their own shepherds have no pity on them. Read Jeremiah 5. Read Hosea 12, 8. It's all there. They're becoming rich by trafficking in sheep, not caring for the sheep. Read Ezekiel 34. That's what these people are. And what does it lead to? Judas. You understand? Bless God. Jesus is warning us. John, in Revelation, says those who will take it the number of the beast will be because of material financial considerations. John begins in his epistle talking about the Antichrist by saying, Love not the world, neither the things which are in the world. Let's continue. There are good girls and there are bad girls. Good girls and bad girls. I married a good girl, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> Sometimes good girls behave like bad girls, but bad girls never behave like good girls. Emptier than a harlot's smile, right? Some poor drunken yobo walking through Soho at night, good time for you, smiling at him. All she wants is his money. There's God's woman and there's the bride of Satan. The good women in the Bible teach about God's woman. The bad women in the Bible typify Satan. Queen Esther, the feast of Florence, begins with Eve. 
But enmity between you and the woman. Hava, Eve. Esther, Sarah, Leah, Rachel, Ruth, Mary the mother of Jesus, Deborah, Yael, all the good women teach about the bride of Jesus in some way. Either in the aspect of Israel as God's woman or the church. Or both. Bad women teach about someone the book of Revelation calls the woman Jezebel. Now first of all, we've got to understand something about Babylon which I'll elaborate on a bit later. Babylon was the political capital of the world where the mystery religions began. They found their way to the city of Pergamum in Asia Minor and there's some kind of a tenuous association between the Antichrist and Pergamum because that's where Satan's throne dwells. I don't mean geographically, but I mean what Pergamum means. We have a teaching on the seven churches and goes into this in depth. Pergamum means divorce in Greek. When God divorced Israel and Hosea because of idolatry, Jesus divorced the church in Pergamum because of idolatry coming into the church. When you see an idolatrous church, that has something to do with the Antichrist. The Pergamum connection. Pergamum means divorce. You understand? Hosea, and then it's in Revelation chapter 2. Be that as it may, these things come via Asia Minor, the city of Pergamum. Even the altar that they excavated was Satan's throne, as you can see it in Berlin, some German archaeologists excavated at the earlier part of the century. And they come to Asia Minor, into Greco Roman civilization, and then from the Greek and Roman world, these mystery religions get into things like Roman Catholicism. Freemasonry, etc. You know, only Christians who are Freemasons, they all have their head examined. In Northern Ireland, there's so many Christians involved in Masonry and in Masonic lodges, and they don't know what they're even doing. They're out of their minds. Nonetheless, Babylon, this idea of the confederation of the political system with false religion. Let's look at Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 to 5. And one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came to me, saying, Come here, and I'll show you the judgments of the great hall that sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And she carried me away, he carried me away into the wilderness by the spirit, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet sheet filled with blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns, ties in with Daniel's visions and so on. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hands a gold cup filled with abominations of the unclean things of her immorality. And upon her head was written a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. And it goes on to describe this city as seven hills, the Capitolina and so on. This description could only have been understood in the early church as Rome, only. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Even the Roman Catholic Church admits Peter was writing from Rome, and what does it say? She who was in Babylon greets you. The early Christians identified Rome as Babylon. The mystery religions that began in Babylon came to Rome. Now you've got to understand this from a Jewish perspective. Both the first temple and the second temple were destroyed on the same day of the Jewish calendar, the Shabbat, roughly the 9th of August. They read the Book of Lamentations that day. Or they, they call it Ahan in, in uh, Hebrew. And they mourn the destruction of the temple. Both destroyed the same day. Jeremiah was one of those prophets who predicted for his own time, for the first coming of Jesus and for the return of Jesus, almost all in the same breath. He made double prophecy. The things he said about the destruction of the first temple are recapitulated or happened twice in the destruction of the second temple. As the Levites, the religious leaders, turned the Jews against Jeremiah and put him in prison, and that resulted in God's judgment and the enemies destroying the temple in Jerusalem, so too Jesus comes, the Levites, the religious leaders, put him in prison, turn the people against him like they did with Jeremiah, who's a type of Jesus, and this brings God's judgment. And in Rome, comes and destroys the second temple the same day under very similar historical circumstances. The destruction of Samaria with the women eating their babies 
what happened with the destruction of the first temple, Solomon's temple, and what you read about in Josephus, the historian, the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD, the events are all very similar. And they all typify the great tribulation at the end. The Christians were rescued out of Jerusalem under the leadership of Simeon because they knew what Jesus said. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, get out of here. They thought that that was the rapture. And what happens to Jerusalem after the believers are taken away is a type of what will happen in the tribulation to the world after the church is removed. You understand what I'm saying? Women eating their babies and all this stuff. Terrible. Nonetheless, the early Christians knew that the mystery religions that began in Babylon made their way to Rome. Rome destroys the first temple. Rome destroys the second temple the same day. You understand? Rome was Babylon to them. Peter writes, he was in Babylon, Greece. Here. But it's this woman on seven hills. The woman who Revelation calls Jezebel. The spirit of false religion. The same as the good women teach about the bride of Christ, the bad women teach about Jezebel. But beginning with the woman Jezebel herself. Pay attention, this is a little bit complicated. She coveted Naboth's vineyard. She wanted to get the vineyard for the political power of the king, right? This brings her into conflict with Elijah. That's what happens with Jezebel. Now, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all have the same spirit, didn't they? So what happens? The wicked woman tries to get the king to kill Elijah. John the Baptist, the same spirit. Herodias, the wicked woman, puts the king up to kill an Elijah. You understand? The ministry of Elijah ends where Elisha's ministry begins, on the plain of Jericho. The same place where the ministry of John the Baptist takes place. You understand what I'm saying? In the wilderness. Somehow, the false religious system of the world at the end puts up the political system of the world to try to get the vineyard. Certainly, the nation of Israel, but more than that, the church. You understand? And somehow, this re-engineers the conflict with the spirit of Elijah in some way. The spirit of Elijah comes back and confronts us in some way. You understand what I'm saying? One typifies another. The woman, Jezebel. She is a very, very naughty girl. There is no hope for her. You can send her to boarding school, beat her with a cane, or marry her up to a drunken sailor. It won't do any good. She's hopeless. It says in Jeremiah 51, Babylon cannot be healed. You be careful of these Christians who are staying in the Roman Catholic Church, thinking they can change it from within. They're out of their mind. Babylon cannot be healed. Long before the Reformation, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, these people didn't begin by beginning other churches. They were Roman Catholic clergy. Not only were they Roman Catholic clergy, for all their mistakes and faults, and I'm no Protestant, I'm just a Christian. They tried to reform the Roman Church from within. Francis of Assisi tried to change it from within. Thomas the Kempis, who wrote the, uh, the Imitation of Christ, tried to change it from within. Erasmus of Rotterdam, the greatest scholar in the world, tried to change it from within. Vincent de Paul tried to change it from within. Teresa of Avalon tried to change it from within. Madame Guillaume tried to change it from within. Several well-intentioned popes tried to change it from within. Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli tried to change it from within. But Babylon cannot be healed. And it's not only the Roman Church, it's the false religious system of the world generally, particularly where it has a political confederation and involved with business. You think of the Ambrosioni Bank scandal, the Calvi affair, a couple of hundred murders, the Vatican paying hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation with banking scandal. In the Middle Ages, the Vatican was the center of world banking. The Lombardi family, the Medici family, the Borghese family, the rich Italian banking families vied for the papacy because that was the key to controlling international banking. The whole involvement of the, of, of the Vatican with the Mafia over, over the decades and the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the whole thing. Uh, forget about it. It all goes back to inferior alone, the very things that the Christians are up against. Even the, the pagan overlap, the phallic symbol from Egypt, right in St. Peter's Square. <laughs> what it is. Babylon cannot be healed. Nonetheless, let's go on. Queen Athlia, a wicked woman. 
to get the son to behave in a certain way. Now the early Christians thought Nero was going to be the Antichrist. Where it says seven, six was, one is, is not, but is to come again. He was, he is not, but is to come. They thought that was Nero. He was the first person whose name they ever counted out the Greek and Latin numerals to be 666. His mother's behavior and the way he began to mean a seemingly benevolent emperor to a wicked one who persecuted the church is like Queen Athlea and her son in the Book of Kings. When the early Christians were persecuted by Nero, it was Rome burned. You have the whole Babylon motif in the Book of Revelation that comes from Isaiah and Jeremiah. So even before Revelation was written, this idea of fallen as Babylon, the early Christians knew that was about the end of the world. So when Rome burns under Nero, and they say he fiddled, which is probably only a legend, they associated this with fallen as Babylon. And then he turns against the Christians to understand the type of what's going to happen at the end. Queen Athlea, Herodias, Jezebel the most important, and Delilah. Now remember, Jesus warns the church in Revelation to pray you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, seduces my servants, teaching them to eat food sacrificed to idols, transubstantiation. Actually worship the bread and wine offered before a graven image, bow down to it and worship it, eat it. Eating food sacrificed to idols, the woman Jezebel. And the Nicolaitanism, Nico, suppression of the laity, the people, a priestly class, claiming power over the people, the clergy. This whole thing in the Church of England can women be priests is ridiculous. Every Christian is a priest, with Jesus as our high priest. If you're not a Christian, you're not a priest, and if you're not a priest, you're not a Christian. No such thing as a priest in that sense anyway. I don't know what they're arguing about. That's what happens when you follow tradition instead of Jesus. Nonetheless, one more of these bad girls, and then we'll take a break. Delilah. Samson, as best I can understand, typologically illustrates the church at the end. Good guy had a heart for God, but he had a weakness. A weakness that many of us can relate to. In any event, in any event, what does he do? He gives his strength to the wicked woman. Look at Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1. My son, give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may observe discretion, and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress dip honey, and smoother than oil, anointing is her speech. But in the end she is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of Sheol, she does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable, she doesn't know it. Now then, my sons, listen, do not be taught from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel ones. What happened to Samson? Lest strangers be filled with your strength. What happened to Samson? And your heart urged good to go to an alien. He hated instruction. He gave his strength to the wicked woman. Right? Now, I don't say that this is not gives practical advantage about the sexual morality to, to believers. It does. But it, midrashically, it is something much deeper. The wicked woman here teaches about Jezebel, the spirit of false religion. Samson gave his sense to the wicked woman. You see how midrash works? And what happened? He totally laid waste by it, but in his grace and in his mercy, God revived him. And the victory comes. That's what happened to Samson. And in some sense, that's what's going to happen at the end. Make sense to you? And we'll look at this further when we get into Proverbs chapter 7. God bless you. Val, you want to come forth?